Hello and welcome. In this video, we are going to talk about the history of physiotherapy and go over some of the key moments that brought the profession to where it is today. We might think that physiotherapy is a relatively new profession when compared to medicine, but there is actually quite a long history behind it. Physiotherapy is one of the oldest organized health professions and is older than many other allied health professions. It has its roots in the physical therapies that date back to ancient civilizations like China and India, and later Egypt, Greece, and Rome. Greek physicians like Hippocrates and Galen provided accounts of physical therapies being used and accurate descriptions of bones and muscles, respectively. The Romans regularly used thermal therapy. Through the Renaissance and the Enlightenment periods from the 14th to 18th centuries, there were significant advances in these sciences and the understanding of the human body. The sciences of anatomy, physiology, and kinematics were developed during this time. In addition, it was around 1750 when the first electrotherapeutic devices were developed by Johann Gottlieb Kruger and Christian Gottlieb Kratzenstein. Then, in 1813, in one of the major milestones in the development of physiotherapy, a Swedish man named Per Henrik Ling founded the Royal Gymnastics Central Institute, where, among other things, medical gymnastics and manual therapy techniques were taught. A graduate of the school would be called a Schuch gymnast who practiced Schuch gymnastic, which translates to sick exercise. It wasn't until 1851 when the German physician Lorenz Gleick first used the term physiotherapy in an article that we first see the name that many now use for the profession. In 1894, the Canadian doctor Edward Plater was the first to use the anglicized form physiotherapy in the Montreal Medical Journal. Moving forward to another major event, in 1894, a group of four British nurses and midwives, Lucy Robinson, Annie Manley, Margaret Palmer, and Rosalind Paget, formed an organization called the Society of Trained Masseuses. At the time, word of the massage scandals had spread across England. There were no regulations and standards in training masseuses, and it was difficult to distinguish legitimate massage from prostitution. The subsequent actions of the newly formed Society of Trained Masseuses paved the way for physiotherapy to prove itself as a legitimate profession. They began to create rules of professional conduct for members, to publish in medical and nursing literature, and to only treat patients referred by a doctor as well as only treating according to the doctor's instructions. They also created a national examination that a student had to complete in order to register with the society. Interestingly, prior to 1920, the society was made up of women who treated only women, and men were not allowed to register with the society. This was likely in an effort to avoid occurrences of inappropriate nature and consequently prevent attempts to delegitimize the profession. Anne Perry argues that it was also an effort to create a new profession for women. One of the events that really catapulted the profession forward was World War I. The modalities that were being used in treatment previously were easily adapted to the injured soldiers, and massage became an integral part of recovery. There would be entire departments at hospitals dedicated to massage and physiotherapy. Membership in the Society of Trained Masseuses increased dramatically during this war. In the United States, Reed College in Portland, Oregon graduated reconstruction aides to help rehabilitate returning soldiers. Mary McMillan, often nicknamed the mother of physical therapy, had established the program. She later went on to found the American Physical Therapy Association. Other countries also began organizing their own associations in response to the war in order to provide rehabilitation to their injured servicemen. In the time between the two world wars, massage began to be seen as a passive modality, and masseuses and physios began to incorporate remedial exercises into their care. Apparatus like the one developed by Olive Guthrie Smith could suspend limbs and isolate joint movements. One could carry out active, active assisted, and passive exercises right in their beds. After World War I, American physical therapists turned their attention to conditions like polio. In 1921, Franklin D. Roosevelt contracted polio and was searching for a cure for his illness when he traveled to Warm Springs in Georgia, which claimed that polio patients were finding success in recovery through exercising at the pools. Roosevelt was very impressed with his treatment, which included physical therapy, and experienced improvements in his symptoms. Thus, he opened a polio treatment center called the Georgia Warm Springs Foundation in 1926. 
Roosevelt's positive experience turned more people's attention to physical therapy, and by the time World War II began, there were treatment programs across the United States for children with polio. Of course, this meant that demand for physical therapists skyrocketed. By the 1950s and 1960s, physiotherapists were finally in a position to scientifically and critically evaluate their therapies. They published more and more research that gradually increased in quality as well. The World Confederation for Physical Therapy was founded in 1951, and the congresses it held was a place to share the work done by the scientific community. Over this period of time, there was also growing interest towards specialization and professional autonomy. Specialization in the sense that therapists were recognizing that different patients, depending on their diagnoses, required a different treatment. Previously, everyone was offered largely the same treatment, no matter what the problem was. This was a precursor to the move towards becoming a first contact profession. In the 80s, training and education were moving from the hospital into universities. Practice was also expanding outside of the hospital into the communities, and postgraduate courses were starting to be offered. In terms of practice itself, many forms of passive manual therapies became less popular in the 70s and 80s, and by the 90s, there was a greater emphasis on diagnosis, outcomes, treatment efficacy, and exercise-based rehabilitation. That pretty much brings us to the present day. Obviously, there is so much of physiotherapy history that was not covered in this video. These were only some of the highlights of the profession's journey so far. Different countries will also have had their own unique histories. I hope you found this interesting and that it inspires you to find out more about the history of physiotherapy in your country. Thank you for watching.